Did any of you guys watch the grilling of the tech CEOs that Congress had a couple of days ago? You know, I really don't get why we still do this, why we still bring the CEOs of companies before Congress for them to ask a bunch of questions that they didn't even really think out that much and that they don't even really understand the core of what they're asking. So the whole premise to this was that uh, Amazon, Facebook, Apple, and Google, that's, that's who they all are, were brought before Congress facing possible violations of antitrust law, which basically is a set of laws and regulations that prevent companies from becoming monopolies and stamping out their competition and basically preventing any new competition or any other companies from being able to effectively compete with them. And they also brought up some topics of censorship. Th those were the two major topics that were brought up to these guys. Now, the topic of the uh, monopolies, okay? The main company that was accused of being a monopoly here was Facebook. And I really don't get it. Like, it, it's so frustrating that these boomers are forcing me to basically side with the Zuck. But I can't wrap my head around how Facebook is a monopoly. They already tried doing this a few years ago because this isn't the first time that Zuck has had a congressional hearing. You know, he was there by himself, all wide-eyed, looking like a lizard or some type of a robot a few years ago. Um, but let's, let's think about what, what is it that Facebook does? Okay, so they're a messaging platform because they have Facebook Messenger and they also acquired WhatsApp, but they're in no means the only messaging platform. Okay, there's other messaging apps out there. You've got the, um, I don't even know what Apple's is called. I, I'll call it Apple Chat for the sake of ignorance, but you've got the default Apple Messenger that's on all iPhones, which, uh, you know, that's a bit of a walled garden in and of itself, right? Because only the other Apple people can talk with one another on there. And then if you're, a, if you're an Android user, then you pop up as green to try to, you know, single you out and segregate you from the non-Apple folks. Um, then there's all different types of multi-platform uh, solutions. You've got Signal, right? So Signal is a messaging application, does pretty much everything that WhatsApp does. You've got Telegram, that's another multi-platform messaging application. Uh, you've got Yami, you've got, there's, there's dozens of them, all right? It's just that normies want to use WhatsApp. And I don't see how that's Facebook's fault that they tailor themselves and cater to normies. All right, like that's that's kind of just how you do business, right? I mean, the unfortunately, that's the vast majority of people who are using technology. So if you cater to them and you just make it easy for them, then they're going to use your product. Um, and then as far as a social media goes, like, again, have these guys not heard of Snapchat? Have they not heard of, uh, I mean, even LinkedIn, I'm sure they have LinkedIn's. It do, obviously doesn't work in the same way as other social medias do, because I think most other social medias, uh, at their core, you use them either to, I guess, get laid, or you use it to, I guess, signal to other people that you're popular or whatever. But again, the whole point of that is if you're a man to get laid. So uh, you use social media to get laid. <laughs> I guess you wouldn't want to use LinkedIn to get laid, but you can use Snapchat for that. And uh, arguably Snapchat is, is more effective for that because you have the whole thing where most of the people using it think that posts disappear. They don't really disappear. Uh, obviously, there's all types of ways to save them, but people think that posts disappear. So they're more likely to be risque in what they post in the conversations that they have. So, and that's not, Snapchat actually isn't owned by Facebook. So there you go. That's something that you could use um, Twitter is another one, right? There's plenty of there's plenty of DMs, okay? Everyone knows about sliding in those DMs, and once you slide in those DMs, you're going to be sliding into something else pretty soon. So there's other social medias 
that exist out there. Uh, Facebook isn't a monopoly in that sense either. Um, I think that's about all they do. I, I don't even use Facebook, right? So how can so many people not even use the thing and have it be a monopoly? All right, like monopolies, when we think of monopolies, okay, we think of Standard Oil back in the day, right? They were the only oil company you could use. If you used oil, and everybody did, okay, this was before cars were really popular, but you used oil to heat your home, okay, I'm pretty sure oil was used on trains and it was used on boats, so everybody basically had to use Standard Oil. Um, that's a monopoly. Facebook is not. Now, one of the areas where they were correct is uh, with the censorship, because that's the other reason that they brought all these companies there. Um, I guess not Amazon so much. I don't think Amazon really uh, does a whole lot of censoring and it wasn't brought up for that. Well, it kind of does censoring in other ways, but we'll, we'll get to that later. Um, so Facebook, right? They've got this... Uh, They've got this platform where it's kind of like a town square, right? Like you can go on there, you can post stuff, but you can only post things that follow Facebook's guidelines. And of course, Facebook's guidelines is that you're not allowed to post hate speech and harmful speech or harmful content to their platform. Now, the funny thing about this, and YouTube does the same thing, uh, where they say you can't post hate speech, is that hate speech is very arbitrarily defined, okay? It doesn't really have a legal definition, as far as I'm aware, because there is no legality around hate speech, in at least in America, okay? It doesn't really exist. So the way that it's kind of sort of interpreted is that you can't say something inflammatory, uh, you can't say something racist, you know, so on, sexist, so on and so forth. Although, this is just selective at best. Because if you go on Facebook, there's plenty of anti-white rhetoric that's on there. Okay, there's plenty of, and, and, and not even just like, kind of the vague complaining about white people. I mean, there's plenty of posts that say, we should kill whitey. Okay, there's plenty of posts saying that, uh, you know, all white people do X, right? All white people do Z. And not even just in the way of, like, how comedians make fun of white people. I mean, the type of stuff that if it was applied to any other race, it would be racist and it would get taken down. And it's funny because you can say whatever you want about white people on Facebook, but you can't say anything against Asians or especially not the small hat tribe. Because if you say anything against them, that's going to be hate speech. And some people will try to defend this by claiming that white people have more power and more privilege in this country than other groups. And that's the reason why I brought up those two groups specifically. Because with any metric that you can use to evaluate privilege, whether you want to talk about income, whether you want to talk about uh, lifespans or just general health that people have, whether you want to talk about rates of incarceration, rates of depression, rates of drug abuse, uh, whether you want to talk about divorce rates or the percentage of those groups getting college degrees or getting into Ivy League colleges, those other two groups actually do better than white people do in this country. So even with the clown world rules, they're still wrong. Okay, They're still selectively applying this hate speech rule uh, to people uh, to censor them. So it's arbitrary, and it usually just comes down to if you don't toe the line of what these companies are saying, then uh, you get censored. Now, what is the line that these companies are saying? It tends to be a liberal one. Okay, It tends to not be a, a lot of conservative rhetoric that's coming from these companies. Uh, they don't really, I mean, they allow conservative rhetoric in some cases. Facebook, not so much. I mean, Facebook seems to do uh, the most censoring of conservative opinions out of all of these groups. Um, you know, YouTube, which, of course, is owned by Google, they allow conservatives on the platform to some extent, right? If you're not too spicy, right? If you're like, uh, if you're like a Steven Crowder type, right? Not too spicy, not too offensive, then they allow you. Um, if you're a Gavin McGinnis, then you're, you're too spicy and they don't let you on the platform. 
uh, or at least they ban you and and the only time you show up is people uploading like segments of your show or whatever um but what they do do uh, if you are putting out conservative opinions is they demonetize you right so if you're a youtuber mo most people who are on here are trying to make money right so if you don't get ad revenue, you're basically forced to go out and get sponsors and stuff like that, you know, do it the old fashioned way, which honestly, like if you're not gonna get ad revenue from YouTube, then it's almost like, what's the point of using YouTube in the first place, right? Why not just go and create your own, uh, your own YouTube? Why not just go and have your own radio station or something like that and then say whatever you want if you're gonna have to do the hard work of getting sponsors anyway? Now, I kind of get why these companies take the liberal position. Uh, I don't really agree with it, but I'm going to play devil's advocate for them for a second, even though, again, I don't agree with it. And uh, I don't think it's right since they basically claim to be a platform and not a news publication. And so they don't get regulated as a news publication. So you got to understand what the whole... The whole goal behind a corporation is okay corporations exist to have continued growth and to make money right continued growth in money as well you know they want to increase their revenue they want to increase their reach they want to increase their stock price and all of that supports their bottom line and unfortunately if you're trying to make money the liberal position is where the most money is at uh, because one of the fundamental things about liberals is that they tend to think more with their emotions okay now i'm not saying that they're all completely brain dead um and i should probably clarify i'm, I'm more specifically talking about leftist because when i say liberal you know people think of classical liberals like jordan peterson types i'm not really talking about them i'm talking about you know the modern day you know, like Black Lives Matter and uh, what's the new thing they say, ACAB, all the, the people that are rocking all those slogans, those are the people I'm talking about. They tend to have a very emotional thought process, which is why they cling to things like Black Lives Matter and ACAB, because if you apply any type of logic to these movements, you can see that they're not very good. I mean, with Black Lives Matter, it was started by a member of the Small Hat Tribe. It's none of their rhetoric talks about fixing the real problems in the black community, you know, fixing uh, single motherhood, fixing people that are just perpetually on welfare and not even ashamed of it, like they're proud to be on welfare, not fixing the drug abuse, not fixing all of the deep-seated cultural issues in the black community. They're, they're not about that. They're just about surface level stuff, which is every single time a cop shoots somebody, whether it's justified or not, we got to make a big brouhaha about it. Um, so people cling to that because obviously it's emotional, right? The old saying in the news, if it bleeds, it leads because it just pulls at people's heartstrings. Oh, poor black man got shot. Oh, we got to we got to make a post on Facebook. We got to change a hashtag. We got to change our profile picture to a black and white thing. Um, but here's the other thing about people who think emotionally is it's much easier to sell stuff to them. <laughs> OK, this is this is again, you trace it back to the dollar and you get to the real root of the problem here. It's so much easier to sell to liberals than it is to conservatives. I have firsthand experience with this because I've worked in sales for over five years. And I can tell you, it's if someone comes in, uh, like with computer sales, that's, that's the sales I did the most. You know, if somebody comes in, and uh, you know they're, they're more of a liberal, you know they're more of a leftist, right? They have the Starbucks, they ignored all the other computers in the store and went straight to the MacBooks. It's like, all right, this is going to be easy to sell to them. I'm going to sell you a, a MacBook Pro. Okay, even though all you're doing is web browsing, I'm going to sell you some AirPods to go with it. I'm probably going to sell you an iPhone because, you know, all I got to do is show you some new feature, right? Or let you hold that iPhone. You're like, oh, I must consume the new product because, uh, 
you know, it pulls at their heartstrings. It gets at their emotions. Whereas a conservative person, they tend to just want the best bang for their buck. Okay. And even then, they, they still oftentimes want a discount on something. Uh, they, it seems like they do a little bit more research. Now, not always, right? Like, there's plenty of ignorant conservative boomers that I've sold laptops to. Uh, and in some cases, you can, you can upsell them a little bit uh, to, to generate more revenue. But in general, when you're selling things to people, uh, more sales are done to liberals. And products that have much higher margins can be sold to liberals. That's, that's the big thing, right? I mean, if I think about the type of stuff that conservatives buy, like, uh, well, the most stereotypical thing would be like trucks and guns, right? So there's not a huge margin on firearms. There just, there just isn't, okay? Most of the cost associated with them is tax, is taxes, right? Taxes for having the firearm, uh, transfer fees, registration fees, all that jazz. But as far as the cost to produce a firearm and then the difference that the a vendor sells it for, it's not huge. It's certainly not as huge as something like Nike's or um, what's what's the shoe, that shoe that Kanye West made? Yeezys, right? So you take something like Yeezys. They're made in, in China or, or Bangladesh or some other third world country, just like all these other shoes are. Uh, by people that are getting paid pennies to make them. Okay, maybe what they do is they take the best worker from the Nike factory and they make them work in the Yeezy factory. But then these shoes get sold to people, to the consumer for like $2,000. And almost every time that I've seen someone wearing Yeezys, it's always one of these like left, like leftist people. Um, same thing with like Louis Vuitton, uh, all the stuff that rappers like to wear essentially. Because they're a pretty good example of leftist people. Uh, all of that, all the stuff they wear, Louis Vuitton, Gucci, it all has these really high margins. Um, it, this is also the same way. I know I'm off on this whole tangent about advertising. We'll circle back to the tech. Uh, this is also the reason why, if you look at commercials, um, oftentimes they'll be... I don't really know if sexist is the right word because I don't I don't really get this feeling from them, but I'll just say it. They they seem a little sexist, right? And not sexist against women because these commercials always make the man look like he's a dope. And then you'll have the woman who's like, ah, oh, you knucklehead. Let me, you know, let me park the car. Or let me uh, open this jar or do some other thing. And they just always make the guy look useless. The reason that they do that is because Women are the ones who buy the products, okay? They buy, women spend money on stuff more often than men do, okay? or at least on consumerism stuff more often than men do. And uh, women are fundamentally more liberal than men because again, they think with their emotions more than a man does. So obviously they're gonna kind of trend more towards that left-wing idea. So they're targeting leftist people well they're, they're not even necessarily targeting leftist people they're just targeting emotional people because those are the people who are going to buy stuff especially stuff that has high margins and so fundamentally they have to have a political bias to support that okay they can't they're not going to cater to cletus because cletus doesn't buy anything that's just the fact of the matter but they really do take it too far because Facebook shadow bans a lot of conservatives from their platform. Okay, they shut down, uh, who was I think it was Trump Jr. for just talking about hydroxychloroquine. Not even saying like, oh yeah, this absolutely 100% works, you should go take it. Like, no, they're, they're just alleging that there is this uh, medication that might help against COVID-19, right? Might, that's the key word there. Uh, and he gets taken down. And the Zuck's excuse for this is, oh, well, if somebody sees that, they might think that it's actually a cure and then they'll go take it and yada, yada, yada. And this is one of the points that these uh, people in Congress had that actually makes sense, which is that that's for the end user, right? That's for the person reading that. I mean, look, if you're such a dope that you see a post on Facebook and you take it at face value as 100% correct, and then you go out and you take some medication and you die, 
That's just mother nature doing what she needs to do. That's that's just weeding out the low IQ people from the gene pool, which frankly, we could really use some of that, uh, not just in this country, but all over the world. Okay, so uh, this is how they kind of shut down, um, you know, free speech, right? Uh, all under the guise of hate speech. And YouTube, uh, well, not YouTube, but Google, they actually take this a step further because they... Uh, in Gmail actually filter out certain, um, what is it, like people who are running for office, they'll basically filter out their campaign emails or, uh, you know, they try to send out campaign emails. And then obviously, you know, this gets spammed if you're not signed up for it, but people who are actually signed up for it, right? People who actually want to see these emails aren't getting them or they're getting put into the spam folder. And this is something that you, that not YouTube, that Google has to be doing on purpose. Okay, they're specifically targeting certain senators, certain Congress people by having their campaign ads not get sent out to people to try to mess with their, um, you know, obviously try to mess with their election results. And speaking of messing with the election results, there was internal emails from C not not CEOs but executives at Google where they were donating to the Hillary Clinton campaign and they were trying to manipulate the algorithms on Google to try to increase the Latino vote in key states for Hillary Clinton. So this is a clear example of them having a bias, having a political bias, um, and that's not allowed if you're a major company, right? You're supposed to be neutral in these type of things. You're not supposed to meddle with our elections, but yet they did it anyway. And then with Apple, so again, we're going back to uh, the ignorance of these Congress people. So they try to allege that Apple is a monopoly by only having one app store on there because you can't sideload apps or do anything like that. Uh, like you can on Android. I'm glad that they didn't try to accuse uh, Google of being a monopoly for that because holy cow, it would have really pointed out how ignorant they are. Um, but yeah, you can't sideload apps on an Apple platform uh, and who cares, right? That doesn't make them a monopoly because here's the thing, okay? <laughs> you gotta understand the consumers that are using these products. What percentage, if, if you could load some alternative app store like F-Droid or whatever on an iPhone, how many Apple users do you think are actually going to use that, okay? The whole Apple ecosystem is a walled garden, and the people that exist within that walled garden, they actually enjoy it, okay? They like being in the walled garden. They like Tim Apple not letting them do the things that they're not allowed to do. They they genuinely enjoy this. They genuinely enjoy not having all of the freedoms that other types of technology give them. So again, that doesn't make them a monopoly. And there's literally other smartphone manufacturers. Okay, Not a whole lot because you pretty much have, you know, Google. And then uh, there's PinePhone, which is like de-Googled stuff. But again, normies don't use that. So it might as well not even really count. But you've got Google, you've got the Android world. So once again, they are not a monopoly. Now, after all of this finger wagging that Congress did, this uh, you could see right here, it was three hours. I think it was actually longer than that if you count the setup, it was like six hours. Um, what, what was the outcome, okay? Were these tech companies hurt? Uh, not really. Okay. There's no regulatory changes that have occurred so far to these companies. Just like when the Zuck was up a couple years ago, there's no regulatory changes that happened to Facebook uh, at all. And if we look at what really matters, because again, these are corporations, they care about growth, they care about making money. This is what this is literally their livelihood. These companies' stocks actually went up. <laughs> <laughs> Their stocks went up after this congressional hearing, all of them except for Google. Google's stocks actually went down a little bit. Um, and I have a theory as to why that might be. I think it might have been because of Google's nonsense with China 
and their refusal to work on Project Maven. So Project Maven, for those of you who don't know, was basically an AI project. I believe that it was directed at optimizing drones for them to basically be able to better identify their targets on the ground, like train them on imagery a little bit better. Um, so Google didn't want to participate in that because they say that we're not going to be involved in war. Okay? They don't want to contribute their technology to bombing people with drones. And fair enough, right? You're a private company. You don't want to assist in any type of military action. Then, eh, good for you. But they, uh, they make contributions to the Chinese military. Now, they don't do that directly. Okay. When I say that, it almost sounds like fake news. So let me walk you through how they make these contributions to the Chinese military. Um, Google has a lot of projects that they do in China around AI. And they're open source projects. Okay, This is what uh, Pichai actually brought up to try to defend himself against these claims of Google helping China. But here's the reason why Google does these open source projects in China. Because if you are a software company and you don't donate or you don't just give your technology to China, they're going to try to copy it. All right. This is exactly what Hawaii did with Cisco. Okay? They just copied Cisco's technology, even down to the pamphlets in a lot of cases, right? Like it's literally a carbon copy of what you get with Cisco routers just built into uh, Hawaii and their routers. So they're going to copy you if you don't just give them your technology. So Google's like, okay, we're going to go over there. We're going to open source and give them our technology. Now, they don't necessarily give this directly to the Chinese military. I think in some instances they might have, but mostly what they do is they're working with Chinese universities and they're working with uh, other companies in China. So they're trying to say, hey, look, we're not working with the military like how the United States' DOD came to us and asked us to work on Project Maven. But here's the thing about China is that there is no real separation between the universities and private companies and the military. It's, it's all connected. It's all run by the government in China. That's what you get with communism. So... It doesn't matter that you're not sitting across from some military general, uh, you know, giving him blueprints of how they can use your AI on their drones. OK, if you give it to the universities, it's going to filter its way into the military. And it already has. OK, there's planes in China whose targeting capabilities have been increased as a direct result of Google software. So maybe that's why their stock got affected and these other guys didn't, because obviously if you mess with the military, then uh, Congress is going to mess with you. That's one of the few things that all these boomers tend to agree on is that, uh, you know, our military must be strong. But I've got the feeling that it's just a temporary dip. You know, nothing major has really come from this in the past. I don't think anything major is going to come from it in the future. It's just the reality of the situation, all right? If you get a bunch of old boomers who don't even know how to how to set up their phones on their own without their grandchildren helping them, how in the hell are you going to ask them any real questions and get any real answers from tech CEOs? It's just a waste of everybody's time. Uh, but you know... I guess I was able to make a video around it, so not a complete waste of my time.